continue with the topic of uh, key KPIs, so key performance indicators. And um, to start with this, uh, we'll first do a short recap of, of the um, material that we also did in more extensively in the module, um, module 3 on the validation phase. And we look at, uh, look at the, the most important uh, KPIs that are in context of converting, uh, converting the customers into, um, or converting the interest into actual paying customers. So this is pretty uh, a universal concept. Uh, and this is basically the key moment where really all of the effort and everything that is being done is, is basically meeting the customer. So, so this is the point where, so, so, so to speak, the, the, the rubber hits the road and uh, the clear point where your offerings is meeting the markets. And then, of course, that happens through multiple different ways and multiple different channels. It doesn't really matter if you, you're doing B2B sales, if you're doing uh, digital uh, cloud service, or whether you have a retail store. None of those would really, really matter uh, because it's about creating the interest and awareness amongst the, the potential customers and the customer segments and then converting them through different stages into actual paying customers and then uh, using or experiencing your product or service and then, then having their basically uh, conclusions out of all of the things that you have put in your thought process. And uh, the basics of, of, of this is um, to look at this uh, through these three key variables. So first of all is of course customer segment or customer sub-segment. Uh, um, so if you're targeting, for example, um, a specific um, market segment first and then in there you have different types of customers uh, using your products that you can further segment. And then you have <clears throat> different communication channels or touch points where you um, you meet meet the customers or potential customers either in form of reaching out to them or then putting out marketing material, aka automated um, uh, sales content to to various different channels to to create the awareness and, and to seek out your customer segment. And um, these variables that every, each of the different customer segments, of course, also have different, different potential outbound channels and inbound channels to, to reach out. So outbound can be, of course, sending out emails, direct emails, uh, calling out the specific customers, uh, going out to the uh, exhibitions and so forth. And inbound channels are more, of course, different types of content marketing, marketing, uh, going to events and presenting on the stage, um, creating PR news articles, uh, putting out other values and taking part in social media communication on relevant topics and so forth. So creating awareness in, in these different channels and you have multiple different channels uh, and segments that you need to also measure separately that you can then of course out of those all of those different measures that you do you can create also uh, an index of what is the overall uh, customer conversion rate uh, and then per segment per channel and so forth so this this can go into very extensive detail and, and at at the beginning, you can start from a much higher level, but ultimately, you, once you keep going, you keep uh, finding new channels and new segments and new things that learn that you then can continue to apply across the board and test what works and, um, and so forth. So the initial step, of course, this is to, to, to find ways to reach out uh, and build that awareness to really get then from that awareness people to come to your website 
or landing page or any other touch point that you, you want them to, to reach first. And then when we look at this um, in, in, in more detail, uh, we are tracking the, the KPIs, we are tracking these individual channels and segments, and then we are tracking individual conversion steps between uh, each step of the funnel. So how many of those that we reach out to or we can uh, identify uh, that someone read something or they saw or advertising or they read our newsletter or they opened our newsletter, whichever of those are the first awareness that we can record that number, that this is how many we captured with this message at awareness level. Then the first conversion rate is, of course, how many of those we actually got to take the next step uh, and, and visit our website and basically, or read our brochure or whatever that, that may be. Um, uh, for example, in, in, if doing a direct sales, then that would mean that uh, they asked for us to send more information. And if they have actually looked at the, the for example, a, a PowerPoint presentation or, or PDF that we shared to learn about the product. <clears throat> or service and then the next conversion after that is that they want to somehow uh, understand the product better so whether that is to to test a demo product or actually have a demo presented for them or some other format that they actually engage more than just uh, reading that they actually engage and do something to get better understanding of the product. So how many can we convert from just reading the basic things to actually uh, take the next level where they get better understanding and uh, a little piece of, of, of experience of the product or service. And then the next conversion percentage is to look at uh, how many actually buy it in. So how many make the decision that, yes, I will, I will buy this and uh, start uh, start using that. So following the buy-in is the actual use. So there can be services where people actually buy, but they never really actually start to use the tool. And they may even keep paying for quite some time, but that is not enough, of course, uh, for business. That's just an open question until they stop paying if it's a subscription service. So you really need to also make sure that they how many of the customers start to use, and, uh, and, and then ultimately from that use, how many of these customers are very happy, uh, don't really have anything to say, not really happy, not disappointed, and, and then how many of them are, are disappointed. And, uh, and then while at the same time as you are looking at the actual conversions on each of these steps, along the way, you are also looking at uh, the, the, the actual uh, rates of how many uh, fully disappear. So you have basically two numbers, those that remain uh, at, the, at, at a certain step in the funnel, so they haven't converted forward, but also they haven't really left. So, so in the sense of if, if just thinking of pure sales level, they haven't said yes, but they haven't also said no. So they are somewhere there in between. And, uh, and you should also keep track of, of those along the way. And the key thing here really is that uh, everything from, at least from a website or definitely after demo, you should have already their contact details. So try to capture their email address or, uh, or social network profile or something um, as, as early as possible. Because after that, maturity of your communication can be repeated uh, either automatically or much more effectively. And oftentimes, specifically everything happening on your website or newsletter, it's pretty much free for the most part, of course, excluding the effort. Whereas everything that you do on the outbound, uh, outbound channels and oftentimes even uh, 
um, uh, some of the inbound channels, they actually keep costing money to, to attract more. And the growth that you are looking to, uh, to create from, from this is dependent on not only how many people you get to your website, but actually the key thing to focus on is all the conversion steps in, in each of this lever because that is the key thing that the more effectively you convert uh, it's it's uh, those that you get to your website and the more accurately you can target only those people to come to your website that are as well in the target segment and cost, customer segment as possible and then if you learn new segments also to be able to target and find them through different channels uh, the lower is your uh, cost of customer acquisition and that's one KPI to follow uh, and then also including um, uh, how, how fast you can basically grow and if you think that you can you can make um, even a 10% increase in any of these steps and, and you make 10% on one step and 10% increase on another step, those all accumulate and, and your conversions can improve significantly. And when you're looking at these different funnels or different conversions per segment and per different channels, you should also look at where the kind of the, the, the biggest gaps are where you can focus to try to make improvements. So when you see that something is performing uh, significantly better than somewhere else, you can think of what learnings can you take from that and apply to another funnel. And also at some point, uh, a, a certain funnel gets to uh, such a level of, of, of quality that it gets much harder to try to improve that than it is to actually try to find a new segment or new channel altogether and then the most important part when we look at the use part of, of this funnel is that that of course everything that happens uh, until the customer actually uses the product in their normal work or in their normal life all of the other steps uh, are, are not really yet giving the customer the actual product experience. So it's giving them an onboarding experience, it's giving them a brand experience, it's giving them many of these other experiences, but not the actual uh, experience of uh, receiving that value that your product or service is creating for them. Either removing pain or, or giving them some advantage or gain or, or benefit. And that is the key that uh, makes them happy or unhappy is that how strongly do you communicate the promise of your product or service? So how, how much do you promise that it will improve their work, improve their life or remove their pain versus what is their actual experience? So that's the offset of, of uh, how happy they are or how unhappy they are or or how well does your uh, promise match and how much of the uh, expectation that you have created them, what is their actual experience then um, with that and, and how happy they are compared to the expectation that you built with the marketing and communication. So it's not only how well does the product work, but how big of promises you make of how much uh, of an impact it will have in their, their, their life or their problem. So if you have even a mediocre product, but you don't really strong sell it, uh, they may still be happier than if you even have a very good product, but you way oversell the expectation or you have uh, way too high pricing. For example, like uh, at this point, uh, Apple is starting to suffer when they have crossed the thousand dollars phone uh, barrier that uh, even regardless of the product quality and even of, 
all of the loyal users, they are starting to suffer that perhaps that is with a bit too much now uh, for, for the actual use experience. So this is, this is the key to find the right balance of features and creating expectations and making customer promises to how happy they are. So if you, if you um, uh, over promise and under deliver, then of course it's likelihood is that they are not, not so happy. If you under promise and over deliver, then it's more likely to get them to happy. But you need to find the right balance uh, for your business. And that's, that's the thing that why you need to track also the, the, the existing customers and have ways to keep tabs on them. Of course, uh, the level of engagement, how much they use your product or service is a good indicator, but it's not as clear as that because also, of course, they could be suffering through all of that use. And the reason they use it a lot is that because it's actually very difficult to use. So, so this is, this is uh, very important. And why is it important? Because, of course, the happy customers you can convert to, um, to, to also in ways of making them to promote your product. Um, so they may do that naturally when people ask, you know, and, and most, of, most of them do, and most of us, as people who use different tools, we, when someone asks, what is a good tool for, um, uh, for website? What is a good tool for newsletter? What is a good tool? For whatever that may be, we have our preferences and we recommend them uh, quite organically. But at the same time, um, for example, Dropbox is one of the best examples of, of how actively they get their happy users to promote uh, their product just simply by giving them more product uh, to use. So they didn't give an affiliate program where they said, if you promote to your customers and someone converts, you get five dollars or ten dollars only thing that they could get was more of Dropbox so that makes a logical sense if they're already happy users then they see that as an additional value because it's more use of the product that they're happy to use uh, if it would be money then perhaps they don't even need to like the product if they're trying to just uh, earn with that so so that's a that's a key factor as well what is the benefit that a happy user gets if they, if they spread the word? So, so it's much more powerful when they actually are happy about the product. And the way to validate is that the benefit that they get is actually more of the product that they are already using. So these are the, the, the kind of the key things to, to find from, from, from this, this picture and the, the, the most important uh, uh, rates to look at. And when you're looking to, for example, communicate to uh, customers or if you're looking to communicate to team members or when you are um, uh, looking to find investors or, or something of that nature, um, the conversion rates and the engagement rates are much more important numbers than, for example, how many vanity metrics like how many people are visiting your website and how many people you are reaching out to uh, because the conversions communicate that uh, that how how effectively you can convert the people that you get on your website into actual paying customers and happy customers and then the the, the number how many people you can get there is more of a, a number of, of uh, marketing and you can Say this, this with this way, this was our cost of uh, acquiring these customers, and these were conversion rates. Gives a clear number that okay, if we put now a uh, hundred thousand or half a million into that uh, machine with those numbers, does it still hold? Like at some point, there would be uh, challenges to find enough quality customers, perhaps, so it doesn't scale unlimitedly but at least it should have clear model to show how does this actually scale out. And without having this, these numbers, it's very difficult to communicate with the investors to, to justify that there is already traction there or there is an unknown uh, cost associated of acquiring customers and, 
customer profiles and so forth. So this is the, the key part where you want to and where you continue to work when you're working with scaling. And of course the the terminology around uh, this where you can Google and you can find a lot of YouTube videos and so forth is around growth hacking and, uh, and of course inbound marketing and, and customer conversions and, and things like that. So the growth engine is it really becomes a growth engine once you get the happy customers to become your inbound and outbound channels organically. So that's why you want to work the whole, um, the whole, not only the whole funnel, but you have to also work at the product level to improve the, the, the experience, give uh, users uh, of the product moments of delight and happiness. So whenever, uh, for example, a place where you can associate this is that uh, if I, as a UX designer, UX, user experience designer, had on, would evaluate the product, and when I would do the customer interviews, either through like pop-up forms uh, in the product user interface or website, or when looking at uh, uh, product demonstration video in a YouTube, I could read from the analytics and see. Um, for example, what part they are going back and forward, or I could ask questions or, or in the interview uh, to, to map their emotions, like when they're happiest, when they are most kind of struggling, uh, and then uh, put in the moments where a majority of customers feel uh, like, for example, uh, in a Trello, that would be when they mark a, a task complete that would be the moment that they feel uh, most relieved in that moment. Every now and then, not every time, but every now and then there could be a random pop-up saying that, uh, would you recommend this to your co uh, fellow uh, peers or customers? Or would you tweet this message and say, uh, we'll give you one month free, uh, next, month, next month free use or whatever that may be. But the point is to identify the moments when their customer is most relieved and or most delight, most happy of using the product, and then associating the promotion point exactly there. But of course, not to the level that it annoys. It could be for for one user uh, once a six month, uh, every six month, it could one time ask for that. Like uh, you see, probably this coming. Um, when you use different products that they ask, for example, for apps that you use, they say, would you do a review on the app store? Uh, but you can easily see if they are asking it at the stupid moment, for example, that you just started to use the product. So if you just started to use the product, how would you be able to recommend it if you don't know what the experience is? Or they keep repeating it too often that it becomes annoyance on its own that actually lowers the, uh, the user experience. So these, these are key things to pay attention. And uh, it's not easy, and, uh, but, but this is the, the, the model that you want to find and over time seek how to uh, achieving. And that is your most powerful thing. So if you get customers in don't just stop when you have got the sales and you have subscriptions, but actually your customers are the most powerful tool uh, to, to get more customers. So as, as a minimum engine, what you want to build on your website, uh, and this is like where to start from, is really build a some kind of lead capture. So on your website, have something that something of value for your customer segment that you can give out for free, uh, whether that's a, a, a demo of the product or free month, or whether that's just um, like valuable content in their other life. So for example, if they are if you're selling a project management tool, then give them some tips on best practices and learnings of project management 
download a, a, a guidebook or 10 key steps or whatever that may be. Um, give some something that has real value for specifically for your customers and give that in return of getting their uh, contact details. So now when you have their contact details and, and their per permission, uh, not everyone gives permission and that's okay to, to promote, but once you have, now you can create automated email messages. So you can find, you can use tools like MailChimp, you can use um, tools like HubSpot, you can use tools like uh, Weebly. Um, different tools have, uh, they, they can offer the opportunity to create um, pr basically unlimited sequence uh, of aut automated email uh, messages to be sent out in a, a random period. So you could send out one uh, right after they download, you could send uh, another one the next day, or you could send another one a week later, you could send uh, the third you know, a month later. Um, it's, it's up to you. And you can choose to structure that in a way where you um, continue to deliver additional value and then you, you have the call to action to buy your product and then on the next one you always deliver some additional value. So not only spamming them or saying that buy, buy, buy uh, this product. Uh, because if you do that, then they basically just unsubscribe. Uh, that's a, that's a, that, that would be not the outcome that you're looking for. So consider how you keep that relationship in a format where you continue to deliver value and at some point the customer wants to try the product or, or maybe they want to buy the product. Um, or, or they just see that, okay, you are delivering so much value that they may as, may as well pay you. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty much the same, same outcome. This totally depends on what your products are, what your services are, um, but um, on what type of messages you should send, what type of sequences you should send. But always consider it from the customer's perspective that they should be receiving value value to, to continue uh, receiving uh, also further, further messages. But most of the time, like for example, this is just my personal preference that oftentimes when I visit something new, I see a, a potential tool, I trust they have similar systems behind there, or at least they have some newsletter. So I don't want to create a task for myself to or send an email to myself that hey re remember to revisit and check this tool out i actually rather use their uh, newsletter system or whatnot and i just put my email there and i trust that they keep me and they they notify and inform because i was interested in that but i maybe didn't have the right time at the moment i didn't have time to really focus on using the product so there's a lot of those who can then be there for three months, six months, even a year before they come back. And then, yeah, now I have proper time. Now I have the right situation. I want to try this product out properly in real work uh, and uh, or real situation. So so don't worry about the time aspect. Don't, don't think of those. Uh, it's more of doing this systematically. The funnel can take a, a longer time for people to convert, uh, of course, the, the shorter it is, the easier it is to track and, and calculate. But uh, anyway, every all of the all of the uh, contacts that you can anyway get into your lake that you can keep promoting to, and they are not leaving. They still want to be there. That's uh, a, a pretty much close to free uh, customer segment that you can keep communicating with. So that's why it's, of course, up to them. If they want to leave, let them leave, and, and, and uh, that's their choice. But if they clearly are not leaving, then, then they clearly are there, that they are still considering, and, and you should uh, can keep communicating to them. Uh, another way to, to um, get more of an organic relationship building is like, in the, in the I would say, older world, with tend to put things in the CRM and then we work through CRM, but that's not, um, that's the work we are doing on our side as companies and businesses, and the customer is just on the other side on the receiving end. 
but things like Facebook group, um, and of course there are others like LinkedIn groups and, and other, other channels or forums that you can create, and depending on the industry and topic, um, there, there can be ones that are much better than a Facebook group. But Facebook groups are surprisingly effective and powerful, for example, compared to LinkedIn groups. Um, just because how Facebook algorithms work and uh, how the communication uh, becomes visible for users there. And again, remember, people are there uh, because they want to be there. And Facebook groups is different from Facebook page. So Facebook page is much harder to get any kind of dialogue or conversation going than a dedicated group that you can set up uh, that has very different uh, ways it works and algorithms and everything behind that. Um, so I can, I can recommend that, but that's more like an open CRM. It's almost like you are, uh, you can almost use it similarly to CRM, but you can have more open dialogue uh, with customers and in a way where you can communicate more of the industries and uh, general challenges or even what challenges customers are having. Uh, open open uh, polls and and, and motivate customer to, to share share more also value between themselves. <clears throat> so this should be pretty much like uh, minimum things and the values that you can uh, values that you can create uh, for example is this download white paper product demo but also webinars is, is one of the uh, very effective uh, formats and of course, offline events or meetup group events, uh, depending on, on, on what, what is your topic. It doesn't take too much effort to come up with something of value uh, of your own learnings or of your um, company learnings or industry learnings or introduce even others, uh, peer customers or customer cases and have some of your uh, customers or partners to come present and use that to capture uh, the contact details of those who are interested in the subject matter. So here's really like the minimum engine that you can start with and you should have in place. So for example, compared to not having something like this in place is that uh, there's a lot of activities going already on the, on the sales or outbound, in, inbound activities, but there is no capturing the contact details into this lake but just the only thing is trying to purely directly convert everyone to buying customer. And if that doesn't happen, then this kind of in-between uh, awareness, uh, between the awareness and buying, that group of people just keeps disappearing and, and uh, it becomes uh, every time the same cost to even acquire them back. So have this kind of minimum things in place as first things first when you consider the scaling. So then let's look at more uh, a, a good set of KPIs. This is by a serial entrepreneur, VC, uh, Andres and Horowitz. Um, this is a good set um, to go through. Um, so these are combinations of, of broader business and, and financial metrics that we will, will go through. So uh, the total addressable market, so that's, uh, that basically is how big is the market that you are in, uh, seeing uh, for your product or service. So find a way to calculate what that market would be for you. <clears throat> and then of course, <clears throat> be, be realistic of that to take into account your abilities to, uh, to, to access that market address that market, reach that market, and, uh, and also, um, also the competition uh, factor in that. So there isn't, like, the more accurately you can describe your market, so if you're doing uh, whatever the product is, then it's not all the people in the world that are using that product, um, or would be able to, you, you would not get 100% of all that market but you can, you can define 
your market that this is our total addressable market and then you can explain how you, you have defined that market for you and that's your total ad, uh, addressable market. You can create a couple of versions out of that that this is the total ad, addressable market that we can imagine being able to address and then this is also the additional potential market that we may be able to address. That's fine. Uh, but have this somehow described. Uh, the annual run rate, basically that's that's how much uh, uh, you, your expenses are. So how much is your expenses to run the company uh, and how much you have uh, basically capital or resources secured for how long, uh, how long you can keep this business running. Uh, basically with that with that cost structure and and then average revenue per user so this is now when you you sell the product so most of the times if we think through subscription then that is like like how much are you getting from individual uh, customer or user so that is there there once you get them as a customer for example how long are they going to remain a customer on average before they are no longer a customer? Of course, we would love to have lifetime customers, but that's not the reality. So there's usually a, a beginning and the end. Uh, either that someone changed their position in a company and then they reduce their uh, use or stop their use or whatever that may be. Uh, cross margins, so basically that is uh, how much profit uh, is, is, uh, is you are having between uh, the, the actual revenue and costs of acquiring that customer and then of the uh, cost of, of uh, serving that customer. Um, sell, to trade, sell through rate, uh, inventory terms, so how much are you selling through versus uh, how much uh, you are not selling. This is specifically for physical products. Uh, or other capacity that you, you have <clears throat> and specifically if you have inventory of products then then how long are they in the inventory uh, on average because you, you buy a lot of let's say you buy a thousand units and then how long how long is that on average that that thousand units turning in your inventory um, bookings versus revenue so this is so you're doing some kind of uh, uh, media content, for example. How many of them uh, or events, how many of people book for the event and how much you actually make revenue out of that. Uh, reoccurring revenue versus total revenue. So total revenue is, of course, everything that you as a business, everything that you sell, how much money do you get in, but how, my, how, how much of that as in euros or dollars or so forth is actually reoccurring that you, you so you don't have to sell it over and over again so this is clearly for example comparing selling a project and then delivering that project that was the cost of the or the revenue of the whole whole project and the reoccurring revenue is that that you sell a subscription so what is the uh, the percentage and, and you euros or dollars compared to total revenue versus reoccurring revenue Cross profit, uh, that's, that's the, the overall profit that you are making in the context of all of the different sales uh, of different products. And, um, and compared to cross margins, that's is in, in, in individual products or, or services or, or, or business models. And burn rate is, is this, um, how much are you actually uh, burning money uh, if uh, this is a specifically relevant when you don't yet have profits, uh, you don't have, uh, you are not live, if, you do, if you're not living yet from the actual sale, sales based profits and you are not living from revenues and you are not in a positive cash flow situation, um, then the burn rate is clear. It's like how long can you run this business with assets that you have? Um, with the money money basically you have and this is specifically when you're building venture with investor money or grant money or 
of money that you have acquired and, and your, your basically your burn rate means that, that if you have 1 million in a bank account and you are spend, your burn rate is uh, 100,000, then it basically means you have 10, 10, uh, 10 months um, until you run out of money. So your burn rate would be 100,000 and, and that would give you 10 months to work until you need to find a uh, hundred thousand profit or you need to find the next investor to to invest into the growth uh, regardless of the profit uh, total contract value versus annual contract value so this is for example uh, important in the b2b business so when you have customers that uh, that you have uh, made a contract with to delivering uh, first, for example, setting up the, the, the pro product into their business, <clears throat> then there is some subscription uh, value of, of running that, that, that business and it's valid now for next three years or five years. So that would be the total contract value. How much are we, how much is the customer committed to paying us with this existing contract that we have versus how much is the value of this contract or each of these contracts per year for us. Um, lifetime value is, is similar to total contract value, but this is more of the, um, the how much do we get from a customer on average in their whole lifetime of what they use our product. And if we look at average revenue per user, that's more of a at monthly level or or annual level. And then lifetime value looks more of of individual customer segment for the lifetime of of the typical lifetime of using the service and the value of that. Um, cross merchandise value versus revenue. So, so this is basically to looking um, what is your mer merchandise value uh, and compared to the to the revenue side. And uh, uh, unearned or deferred revenue. Basically, that that means that how much is there. Um, revenue that is in contracts or in place still to come coming uh, but hasn't yet been uh, uh, built so in the cash flow sense it says we have made um, a five-year contract that is going to deliver us this much money we have made 10 contracts that are pending and the money is coming uh, they are not subscription based only they have a date when they end but, but we are paying, billing them on monthly or quarterly basis and, uh, and this is how much we still have money coming in even if we wouldn't sell anything anymore. <clears throat> and these, of course, the, the, the rationale between some of these metrics and numbers are clearly for, uh, for making investments or uh, considering the exit potential, exit potential of the business uh, so if this kind of growth and sales rate continue, it's, it, it, it can be expected to generate this much uh, unearned uh, revenue or total contract values pending. And then that is, of course, uh, how much effective is that? That has a clear indicator of what is the exit potential of the business. That may, may uh, and or is a clear or important point for investors to make the investment for the first place. So all of these, these things are uh, metrics that you can start to consider what are the most relevant metrics considering the type of business you have and also uh, at what point of your scaling and growth do you start to track uh, each of these types of uh, measures. So for example, if you don't have the contracts that uh, are for multi-year contracts, then you don't need to have total contract value tracking. Uh, 
and, and so forth. So at what point does each of these become relevant? If at any point, depending on your type of business. And then the, the customer acquisition cost, of course, that was um, the key when specifically looking at that funnel of acquiring the customers. So how much does it cost to actually, uh, specifically the outbound, uh, outbound side, how much does it cost to, to, to convert one customer, one happy customer out of the whole funnel and from the channels being used. And then uh, economic and other defining qualities. So, so these are more of the, the, the types of things that impact your, your numbers uh, that you should be able to communicate. Uh, do you have a network effect that is, uh, is building in, in the way of your, how you're growing your business? And for example, this could be uh, those happy customers. So if you know that that over time when we keep converting the customer over the funnel that the whole lead time of uh, converting a customer takes an average of three weeks or three months or six months, whatever that may be, then when they start to use the product it takes more, a uh, couple of months more uh, when they can experience being really happy or not happy and that's the time when they uh, they, they, they can recommend the product and then you can say, okay, 10% or 5% of them recommend the product. And out of those 5% who recommend the product, <coughs> uh, uh, they on average uh, bring 10 more customers that after the same period of time becomes very happy customers. So that's a type of network effect. Uh, other network effects would be like like uh, um, uh, like at one point uh, early Facebook time it was like the fact that you wanted to invite your friends to Facebook and every everyone who converted they invited their friends because that was part of how uh, users get to experience value of using Facebook when their friends were there so that was a network effect. Um, another type of network effect would be that, for example, if there would be more of a open CRM product uh, out there where every company that you acquire to start using that product would import their customers and then they would invite their customers uh, to, to be on the other side of the CRM to have dialogue. And then if that would be a very good experience for those customers, using that product then they would say to companies, they would recommend that, hey, I, I know you have a CRM, but I'm, I'm having this great experience with this tool, with this company, that why wouldn't you also use this, um, this type of CRM in your, in your company or a loyalty program, whatever that could be. And then if enough company starts to get that demand from their existing customer base, they would start to look at, hey, Maybe we should look changing this product. It has some new value for, for relationship management with the customers. And then when that cost company would acquire uh, that product and then they would invite all of their customers. So you could see the network effect in motion. So this, if, 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 if you manage to build or if your product or service have these kind of qualities, then you would have, then you, you should, uh, you should first look for possibilities of creating them, but also then uh, document and, and, and create a, a model out of that. Viral, uh, virality, we also already discussed about the viral marketing in, in regards of the, uh, in regards of the uh, communication or marketing channels. Um, other qualities that the company can have, it could have abilities to be uh, good at economic scale, so basically acquiring a strong position in the market. And for example, a, a Groupon was a good example. Even if they themselves um, didn't have big purchasing power, uh, but at the, at the time they were able to build the audience on the other side to build the economics of scale to acquire the product or service very cost effectively 
under the normal market price and that was their economics of scale um, core quality of how they 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 managed to 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 do that business very success, successfully for a certain period of time but it was lacking some stick, stickiness factor mainly that those companies that sold on Groupon uh, didn't really want to repeat that too many times uh, and at some point it, it, it stopped working because uh, it was not generating uh, uh, customers for those businesses or services that had good lifetime value. So as a marketing they could lower the price but at the end of the day they didn't really get quality customers so then they stopped doing it. And these are, of course, uh, typically like the, the ones that network effect has or uh, using this type of strategies to reach the economic uh, economies of scale are typically platform business models themselves. But there are, of course, other ways to consider the platform business model <clears throat> uh, instead of delivering the products or service or assets to customers to make it more as a two or multi-sided marketplace. Where, where, where others create the content or they create the products or they create the services and of course an e-commerce marketplace would be a very easy example of a platform business model where people come to sell products or services and their customers on the other side buying them but there are many many others of course and this I want to show um, in regards of platform economy and platform business models in the in the um, in the first modules on formation, where we looked at more extensively on different business model ideas or concepts to look after, uh, I want to highlight this one slide. The typical comparison of a linear business model uh, kind of business factors in the context of KPIs versus the platform business uh, model, because uh, platform business models are uh, at, at least at this 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 decade uh, and in, in context of, of give or take 10 years pretty much the globally leading business model category and, and you name it whether that's Apple App Store whether that's Spotify whether that's Uber whether that's Airbnb whether that's Facebook uh, whether that's Amazon they all run platform uh, platform business models and the rationale and the difference between the traditional linear business model is that it mainly has that economic of scale as competitive factor. When you get big enough, you start to get uh, competitive advantage because of the volumes and market presence and, and so forth. Um, but the, your value remains pretty much the same and you have to keep repeating this process. Whereas in platform business model, uh, you can deliver quality at different cost levels because you are not the one who has the assets. So, so for example, Airbnb, they don't price the locations. They don't decide what is the pricing on the marketplace, but they rate them and, and that allows that there can be a variety and the, the, it's constantly changing what is the availability and the availability of various levels of cost and quality uh, in an, any given location and, and uh, there's over time much more variety and the network effect kicks in and it's much harder for others to compete with similar level of variety and offering at volume at multiple locations. Uh, the logic here would be of course that okay then everyone we should aim to be a platform business but and then it's of, of course also much more challenging to get it, get it working and typically it may take very long time uh, to build and, and require significant resources to get there uh, and it's a very risky thing uh, but the, at the end of the day uh, the business model itself tends to be a winning model so whoever then manages to build a platform business model uh, in, a, in, in, in the global digital world uh, tends to be the winner. So, and, and then they become a domin really dominant player. 
Then when we look at uh, other products and engagement metrics, um, uh, the net promoter score, this is uh, specifically tracking those uh, uh, happy customers that are promoting your product. Uh, uh, cohort an analysis is basically uh, looking at uh, separation between similar or related customers in your using your service. So this is um, not so much of looking at your only like your specific customer segment, but then a different usage patterns in your product. So for example, uh, how many of people you have in that lake not yet buying your product or how many people you have using your product only periodically, how many people or what type of group you have uh, using your product uh, on daily basis or uh, on very actively or what, what category of, of customers are using specific features of the product uh, and so forth. So basically this is analyzing uh, the behavior of, uh, of the customers and grouping them and, and then uh, learning learning from them. And then uh, simpler categories like registered users, active users, um, channels. So you have channels, but you can also have an inbound, you have sources of traffic. So basically where does that inbound specifically well resonate? Same content in different platforms, but it can also be for example, you, you say we get a lot of people from YouTube, but it may be that it's only one video in YouTube that converts a lot of traffic. Uh, and that may be that it's not your video, it's just that you are mentioned in some very popular video in a YouTube. So where does that traffic actually come from? Um, customer concentration risk. So th this is a specific B2B customers um, if you have uh, uh, one big customer, let's say you have one customer that brings 80% of your reoccurring revenue or, or, or any of that nature, that, that is uh, too much dependency and you have concentration risk. The same can be that all of your revenue is coming from a, a specific use case from Facebook and Facebook could change the rules and, and suddenly your business could disappear. So how dependent are you of any concentration of risk in another platform or a specific uh, customer? Or let's say you have 80% of your customers from a specific country that then changes the regulation and basically your business is no longer allowed or some other political uh, challenges or recession or whatnot. Month on month growth. Uh, this is a, a very important uh, traction and measure when it comes to scaling and measuring scaling. So how much are you growing every month? And this is a very uh, kind of an index number that that if you get if you get this number. Um, working very well, this is very attractive number to communicate uh, for investors or partners or anyone of, of that nature. And at the same time, if you don't have this number uh, uh, in place, in good shape, then your question, then you have to prove much more with the other numbers. So this, this is the one to get. What growth you are communicating is that uh, user conversion growth, is that uh, revenue growth, if, is that growth of uh, available channels for you, is the, what, what is that, that specific thing that you can show the best, best uh, growth numbers. Of course, it, the more relevant it is, uh, the, the closer it is to, to revenue or profit or market, uh, growing market share, uh, the better. The, the churn, that's how many customers you're losing, how much is your uh, basically your um, funnel leaking, but more importantly, how many of people are uh, stop using your products. Uh, downloads, uh, what, how, how many are you getting in, con in, in different phases of, of funnel or, or other digital products and, and so forth. 
so there are many many uh, metrics to look after but uh, the why why highlighting this is of course uh, gives a perspective, clear perspective of what is scalability, what is growth, what type of numbers and what kind of terminology is relevant when in, in that phase and specifically when talking with investors. It's not about talking with ideas and with your team and so forth. Uh, the, the further you go with your scaling and the bigger the numbers, the more you have to have traction and the more you have to be able to communicate uh, this way uh, for, for, for serious uh, professional investors. <clears throat> so if we look at uh, some of the more top level generic uh, KPIs as well, these are uh, uh, more in the targets of measuring activities, so early scaling phase. So you can track uh, things like the quality of your go-to-market strategy. So that is, you, you need to have a go-to-market strategy and you can measure, get feedback on, on that from, uh, from advisors, mentors, uh, just from people you discuss, that you discuss with and, and looking at how you can improve that. Um, volume of inbound traffic growth, uh, quality of inbound traffic growth. So these are more of a descriptive means uh, are you improving uh, the growth? Uh, what is the quality? Uh, same with outbound and the conversion development per product, per segment, per offering and so forth. Uh, time from lead to deal, so how much from the awareness to actual selling the product. Um, time from deal to delivery, so this is specifically when, when you're selling projects or B2B customers. So you make the deal, how long does it take to deliver that? So basically it means how efficient your delivery model is, with whether you're delivering that yourself or whether you're delivering that with partners. Uh, velocity, development of core processes. So basically that is how effectively are, are you improving and iterating uh, the processes uh, that you are running your business with. Measurements of process efficiencies. So this is attached to, um, to how well are you measuring uh, the overall improvements. Because as you can imagine in the business, everything depends on something else. So how effectively uh, you are creating the core processes, uh, how, how those core processes are, uh, how effective they are, and on the same time, how well are you how effectively you are able to improve them will have lead to how your business is either delivering the products or acquiring the customers. Uh, some others, pricing, profitability develop, uh, level developments. So you, so you, depending on different products and offerings at different stages, uh, this is a vari uh, variable that where you're trying to optimize the pricing uh, as one factor in the in the converting of the customer, but also the profitability, so the lifetime value of the product or, uh, or the, the, the project that is being delivered uh, and so forth. So this is a constant variable. How well are you finding that optimal level where you are balancing the volume of customer versus the, the profitability of the customer versus the conversion of the customer. Quality and value of customers. So, so again, the case, for example, that in, in, in those who were on the business side delivering products or services on Groupon, uh, while they got big volume of customers and the Groupon was powerful in acquiring a lot of new customers that they didn't have before, but the fact when they were tracking the quality and value of those customers, the, the outcome was negative for them and therefore they stopped using it and therefore the whole coupon lost this mojo as well when that became clear that, that people who are tracking for bargains actually are not uh, customers for that you most companies actually want at all. 
Uh, what is the balance between happy versus unhappy customers? Obviously, very crease, crease, uh, crucial <coughs> KPI to track. Um, uh, but oftentimes, you can see that these types of things are not right. Uh, partner network quality and volume development. So partners, of course, have minimum. They have communication channels. They have uh, they have customer acquisition channels, but of course, no partner is happy to just give their channels. Uh, so, so other other means are usually developed for the real win-win uh, partnerships. And you want to want to track what type of partners have actual good quality uh, and good volume balance for the types of customers that you you are also looking for. Um, Productive headcount development. So basically, this is uh, tracking the HR productivity of, of people, and, and basically how effective uh, is the company in acquiring and, and uh, working with people that are productive in their roles. Um, and uh, revenue growth, of course, cash flow management. How accurately are you uh, predicting? Um, the money, money in the bank in the next month and the month after that and the month after that. So that's basically uh, managing the cash flow from the cost side, the variable cost side, the fixed cost side compared to uh, reoccurring revenue, uh, predicted uh, project sales and then the billings from existing customers and so forth. Quality of the pits. So, so you need to continue, of course, pitching for customers, pitching for uh, growing the team, pitching for partners, pitching for investors. So what is the quality of, of your pitch? How simple it is to understand what the company does, how effectively it converts uh, the target audience when delivered, whether that's in video format, whether that's in offline format. Um, so, so improving that. And, to what level do you have get the quality of, of that? Quality of the business plan, of course. Uh, this is, um, we'll go more in details of, of structuring the business plan, but basically that is uh, how well it is communicating all the core aspects of the business for different types of needs that it's used, whether it's onboarding partners, whether it's onboarding uh, new team members, um, so how effective it uses the, the whole business plan communicates everything that is happening in the company for different purposes. The quality of the KPIs uh, themselves. So how well are the, the KPIs uh, helping you to, to run the business? Uh, and, and you can track this from, from uh, the, let's say, the top 10 KPIs that you are looking at for the whole business. Um, the volume of recruiting, how much are you working and how much effort and activities are happening to build your organization for different positions that are needed. Uh, quality of that recruiting process and the onboarding. So how effectively is, is, is uh, the onboarding working? So basically from Recruiting to to actually getting started. How big, how quickly uh, new team members can actually become pro productive, and uh, and how productive they remain. Uh, in, and how well are they they kind of understanding and, and aligning with with the, with the mission and vision of the company. Uh, quality of the stakeholder communications. So specifically. Uh, investor communication, but also communicating for the whole organization, for customers and partners. Uh, what is the quality level of that? So if you never ask feedback, if you never check what questions, what open questions are, if you don't track those and if you don't record them and improve the communication, then of course um, you are not even looking or measuring the, the quality quality of that. And then when we talk with about KPIs, and then when we talk about KPIs, 
really uh, one of the, the big mistakes are that people get overly excited about KPIs and they start to kind of look at KPIs as you know as a, pro as a separate project. Let's put KPIs in place and let's stop measuring all these things and let's put all of them in place. <clears throat> but then at the same time, uh, they may not be able to attach those measures into real processes or real things that are actually happening in the organization. Or every single KPI that are being thought has like additional 25 other things that needs to be done to be able to measure that KPI. And of course that would be totally wrong, uh, wrong in so many levels. There is no point of putting KPIs in place and then not having you know, the cables connected to real processes so that the measure either don't give anything or it gives wrong information because it's only attached to a couple of real things and it's still missing some other points. And that of, of course could be very harmful uh, in communicating wrong information about the company and now decisions would be made, made based on wrong information. So. Uh, counterproductively, it's better to not have KPIs at all if they don't communicate the right answers. So if it's telling that the engine is running at 10,000 RPM when in fact it's running at 1,000, you don't want to have that kind of KPI being used or being invisible. So don't put them in place, leave them in draft format and then forget it and then someone starts to actually look at them. Instead, consider uh, the actual act activities that you are doing, the actual things that you are doing, and what KPIs are applicable to, do, to those, and put the simplest format in place in the beginning. Simplest thing that just communicates one thing, but it's always accurate, and that's the correct thing. The, the other way you can use KPIs when you are growing the organization and putting them in place that you can look individual KPI and see is this so important KPI that we actually have to put it in place as KPI and then make it work. So do all the other 10 or 25 or 35 things so that we get this working and then actually keep repeating and tracking that these things are happening uh, at every day or every week, every month that, that, that we are then actually also getting the right numbers. Why this is very relevant is, of course, that you, as, a, as, as we are now in the scaling phase, we are not only scaling the business, we are all, not only scaling customers, we are not only scaling revenue, we are also scaling the organization. And what that means is that when you are having five people in your team, when you're having 10 people in your team, perhaps even when you have 20 or 30 people in your team, you may still kind of get the sense of how everything is happening by just the meetings and communications and running Slack and you know staying in the information flow. But at some point you will lose control of the sense of this feeling. And that's a new challenge for many who haven't experienced that before. How do you fly that plane with just looking at the KPIs and meters and not having the feed, feedback in a very manual way. And most likely you as a founder or as a core team will actually in future hopefully spend more time on that level. So you want your own metrics and KPIs and measures to communicate the right things for you because at some point you will lose this task and you will get wrong information and you will create the wrong culture in the company. Uh, if those things are not in place. And it will be impossible to fly that plane. So always rather have something simple that works and is understandable in place than complex that don't work or is separated from the reality. So chat, don't just copy paste KPIs from here and put them in a spreadsheet or whatever tool and feel comfortable that now you have KPIs. A typical situation where that could happen and oftentimes happen, they are uh, in, in manufacturing and in some organizations, uh, when you deal with big customer, B2B client, they may ask, do you have ICO something 
system, quality system do you have, uh, Six Sigma or whatever the, the quality system in place that anyone who sells us a product or service or delivers, they need to have that in their organization. Now that could create a situation where then company says, okay, because it seems that not only this customer, but for all of the customers, uh, we need to have compliance with this kind of uh, uh, quality standard rec uh, requirements. So let's put that quality standard in place now into our organization. So then they go and copy paste everything, they put things in place, and this creates a situation where to pass the audit of someone coming auditing, do you have this system in place, that everything is made up, everything is fake, everything is put in place just to pass that uh, audition, that then they give a stamp, yes, you have a quality system in place. But in reality, it's so impossible often to, for auditor to, to know whether it's actually used, or not, whether it looks, appears to be used, you can manually fake that uh, quite easily for one month or for one audit or for a couple of months and then forget it. That can, in an organization that, let's say, if it has about 100 people or 50 people or maybe a couple of hundred people, can start to live a life where there's a quality system and KPIs and then there's the real life. And, and, and now, what that leads to is, is misinformation, uh, not really connected things, <clears throat> and double the work. You have to manually maintain something that looks good and is up to date, but it's really not. And then you do the other things uh, anyway in, in a different way, instead of actually putting a system in place that is simpler, uh, maybe it doesn't yet qualify in all of the aspects and then you know, okay, we still have time time to go to get this to that, that real working level, but let's work towards that instead of uh, kind of maintaining two separate systems and twice the effort. So once you have good KPIs in place, once you have uh, like real numbers behind that over time, let's say, after, after a couple of years, and you learn to, to basically fly that plane with those measures, you can now actually have, you have a real asset in your hands to do a lot of different simulations of what if we do this, what if we would that, do that, let's look through, let's, through, let's run that through our numbers and let's see what type of uh, outcome we could potentially have with this kind of new product offering or with this type of investments, or looking at that specific market entry, now you have real KPIs. Now you have something that you can also convince partners. Perhaps you can open more markets in those second or third categories where others take risk with your brand and product to, to, to make market presence in, in that local market, uh, because you, you can show them simulations uh, that are credible not just that, hey, this is a great product, we are doing this, but you could actually take simulations of how many specific type of, what is the total addressable market in UK, total addressable market in, in, in any specific country, do simulations with these KPIs. And now you start to understand the, the, the kind of the, the level of, of uh, value of this in the context of scaling your company globally. And you can probably get a sense of if you don't have these types of things, of what types of tools you are actually missing.